Aloha Aina, Ano Ai, Valina Kako. Welcome to Free Hawaii News, brought to you by the Kauai Foundation, presenting Hawaiian perspectives on a broad range of topics and issues affecting the Hawaiian Islands, the Pacific, and the world. Your hosts for Free Hawaii News are Leon Kaulahau Siu, musician, composer, diplomat, and political analyst, and Hina Le Moana Wong. Kumuhula, filmmaker, cultural and Hawaiian language preservationist, and community leader. And now, free Hawaii news. Aloha, hia hia kakoa, pauloa e kohova inei pai aina puni. O wau no keia, o hinalei moana, wang kalu. Aloha, and my name is Leon Kaulahau Siu, and we're really happy for you to be here tonight to join us for this edition of Free Hawaii News. For this evening's edition of Free Hawaii News, we felt it was important to bring up some of the most pertinent, the most relevant of questions that we can pose to you, people of our Lahui, people of our islands, for all of you to think about, to consider. One of the most important questions is, what exactly is the Lahui? Who is the Lahui? Leon, what are your thoughts on this? Well, my thoughts is that, <laughs> again, we've been defining this for years now, or we've been re coming into a realization as to who we are as Lahui for many years. So if we started out 20 years ago or so, uh, many people had no clue as to whether or not uh, their allegiance to the Lahui uh, was, was even important. But today, we have a whole new uh, reference, a point of reference as to who we are. And we know now, uh, you know, we, uh, our, our sister Haunani K. Trask, you know, declared in 1993, we are not Americans. Yes. That was very startling I. at that time, very startling. And many, even Hawaiians were saying, what do you mean we are not Americans? But now we actually understand that question. So, that I, so what, we, what has happened is that we have actually come into a realization that we are not Americans. They're, if we're not Americans, who are we? We're Hawaiians. Now, again, that's going to be uh, discussed some more about what that actually means. But the idea is that the Lahui is a group of people that represent uh, and will have allegiance to this nation, to this uh, aupuni that, that we called Hawaii. So um, this is really something that, that has grown over the years. And now the Lahui is, is starting, is coming to self-realization, let's say, and is now looking at where we're going. So to specifically define it right now, I think might not be possible except to say it's kind of wide open for those people who begin to identify themselves with Hawaii, with Aloha Aina, and, and, the, and the Lahui, and their own identity. So what are your thoughts? My thoughts on this, when I think about the word Lahui, Lahui from an Olelo Kanaka or a Hawaiian language perspective, Lahui means it is our race, it is our people, and it is what we associate as the way to define ourselves. Lahui Kanaka. When we say Lahui Kanaka, we're talking about Hawaiian people. Mm -hmm. Not just any old Hawaiian people, we're talking about ethnically Hawaiian people. Mm -hmm. Hawaiian, Kanaka by heritage, by genealogy. That's key. Lahui Kanaka. When someone says, e ku'u Lahui, we or the speaker is addressing their people. So if I say e ku'ulahui, I'm saying to all of you, my people. Now that begets the large question of, well, who exactly is our people? And if Kumuhina gets up to say it someplace, Kumuhina might be talking not only to our fellow Kanaka, but my practice is to include all the other ethnicities too. Mm -hmm. Why? Because for me, it goes beyond Lahui Kanaka when I specifically refer to Lahui Kanaka as that. But the nation, and for those of us who are nation minded mm -hmm. and pro independence minded, Hawaii at the height of our nation prior 
to the illegal acts of the United States of America here in Hawaii, our nation included other ethnicities. And these ethnicities were citizens of the Kingdom of Hawaii. And they were members of the Lahui. Mm -hmm. So this, uh, this word requires us to have a nuanced thinking. It requires us to really think about the subtle intimations that come with this word. Are we referring to Lahui Kanaka or are we referring to Lahui from a larger national and little more inclusive level? Both are correct mm -hmm. and both have their reason and, and, and the need to articulate as such depending on the context of what we're doing. So uh, for all of you tuning in, that's one of the reasons why we did this show is because we'd like to touch upon these topics that help all of us in the Lahui to understand some of these most very pertinent and relevant concepts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and we're not saying that this is exactly the answer or the solution uh, or anything. What we're saying is that this is what our opinions are. And of course, you know, these opinions have been formed over years of experience, but it also is something to stir up your thinking. Because quite often I'm approached by, by people w who assume that when we say Lahui, we only mean Kanaka. And, um, and that is s as far from the truth as, as can be. But ma many people still haven't actually addressed that in their own minds. What is the Lahui? So this is a question for all of us. And so we're suggesting that the Lahui is much bigger and more inclusive than Kanaka. But, I, but I again, the call. Kanaka is that core. Yes, <laughs> it, it is both. Lahui yes. is both. Yes. And so for all those of you out there, just know that as we, together as a people, and as each and every one of you as individuals, find yourself on life's journey and learn. And may we all be lifelong learners at that. But as we go down the road and we learn, it helps us to keep in mind that not all knowledge is found in one school or one train of thought. Aye. And so the perspectives, as you said, Leon, are two distinct opinions. And we leave them before you for you to ponder, for you to ruminate over, and for you to consider. So where are we going next in our evening? Yes, okay. So when, once we're talking about Lahui, we also need to talk about Hawaii as a free nation. I mean, what is that going to look like? Now, this is a very broad, broad uh, area. And um, like, for instance, uh, many of our people can express that they want Hawaii to be free, but they don't really know what that means, mm -hmm. that really means, or um, hadn't even thought about what mm -hmm. that means. And some of our people even think that, yeah, we should be free, but it'll never happen. And so they're resigned to uh, despair, actually, to think that we'll never get there and we're always going to be uh, stuck mm -hmm. with the United States. So, so what we want you to start thinking about is what is the Hawaiian kingdom or the Hawaiian nation uh, going to look like? Um, and we need to start thinking in these terms with anticipation and with a, a uh, positive reference that we are moving into that. And therefore, if we're, we're moving in that direction, we need to start preparing ourselves, preparing our minds in particular for that. You know, uh, Stephen Biko, who is a great uh, South, South uh, African writer uh, during apartheid, um, said something very powerful. And he said, the most powerful tool of the oppressor is the minds of the oppressed. In other words, if we can't envision ourselves as being not oppressed, we're going to continue being oppressed. Or if we can continue in envisioning ourselves as being the low person on the totem pole, we're going to be that low po person on the to totem pole. So what we need to do is to start to, to recalibrate our minds and to reset our minds into thinking, 
yes, the Hawaiian kingdom or the Hawaiian nation is returning. And if so, we better prepare for it. We better be, I, I need to get myself in a mindset that is going to be helpful toward that outcome. Indeed. And when I think about the implications of just the, just the even possibility of political independence, I am reminded that, as you said, the colonizer's greatest tool is the mind, but not only the mind, but the heart mm. and the spirit yes. of the colonized. The yes. mind, the heart, and the spirit of the oppressed. Mm -hmm. And so it is key to each and every one of you out there in our listener audience as we prepare, as we think about the questions that if we believe Hawaii will soon be free, what are we doing to prepare ourselves for it? Part of this preparation comes in the form of tonight's discussion topics that we leave with you all. And we hope that you will sit in your living room, sit in your kitchen, sit in your garage, sit outside in the yard, and have these conversations. And just know, now, don't anybody go fighting because, you know, sometimes <laughs> the, this discussion, these discussion topics are fighting topics. Mm -hmm. um, but again, key to note, the most important tool that will be used against us is if we allow our minds and our heart and our spirit to be dominated, governed, and controlled by the colonizer oppressor. Hi. So, um, to weed out colonial thinking in our people. How do we do this, Leon? Well, actually, you touched upon it during our last show, and that are simple things that actually keep us trapped in a particular mindset, and things like the word mainland. Aha, you know, mainland. Because if we continue to say that, we continue to reinforce the idea that we are subpar to the rest of the nation or the USA. And so we need to start actually changing our vocabulary on, in a purposeful manner. If we change those terms, if we say, instead of mainland, we say the states, or the US continent, or the USA, or anything else, but something that identifies us or them as being separate. Remember, we are not Americans, as how not he came to ask We are not we Americans. We are not Americans. What she did was she laid down that one challenge or, or, or that one statement that challenged all of us to think about who we are. And uh, so when we start thinking in terms of American, if we use a word like mainland or our country mm -hmm. or our president or things like that, now we're attaching ourselves mm -hmm. to that. Yes. And we're becoming actually w much more ingrained into what they had intended to, to uh, yes. what they had intended to do, which was to brainwash yes, us. To brainwash uh, us, to erase. Uh -huh. Many people may not really understand the intimacies of this topic. The erasure of whom we are, the, uh, the insidious act of defining who we are comes in things so small, mm -hmm. s almost indelibly just imprinted, embossed upon us like Braille. If our, re if, if our listeners and viewers in the audience feel some kind of way and they feel torn and they feel hurt because they're not able to say, we are not American. If they always think that we have to include the Pledge of Allegiance and the singing of the American National Anthem as first and foremost, as the front runner versus only singing the Hawaiian National Anthem, or if the flying of the Hawaiian flag could not occur unless the American flag were flying. And these are things that they may seem innocuous, they mm -hmm. may seem insignificant, but they're absolutely key. Mm -hmm. And I question and I challenge all those of you in the viewer audience to think if you are unsettled by this, if you are disturbed by it, if you feel compelled 
to continue to honor the colonial elements that keep our people mentally, emotionally, and spiritually underfoot. Or as a famed kupuna once said about the Hawaiian flag flying beneath the anus of the American flag. <laughs> now that is something to think about. Then it's important for us as a Lahui Kanaka. Aye. We start with Lahui Kanaka first because we as a Lahui Kanaka need to make sure that we can be confident before we can we can look mm -hmm. to the larger Lahui, the nation of other ethnicities that may also have great aloha and allegiance to our cause. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so one other thing that I wanted to point out an example um, of what you just stated about the, the national anthem. Um, the Merry Monarch Festival. I don't know if you saw recently there oh, were some, some yes. things posted about it. <clears throat> yes. So the Merry Monarch Festival, which of course we all revere as, as a <clears throat> wonderful, uh, you know, Lahui uh, event in that, that we celebrate the hula and it's, it's uh, an amazing event. But at the beginning of each Merry Monarch Festival, they have some young child come up and sing the Star Spangled Banner. Yes. And when, when the questions were raised, you know, several years ago about that practice, well, the, they said, well, the sponsors want us to sing it. And they want, the, the sponsors of the show are insisting that the Star Spangled Banner be sung. And so, so we do that. And, and what do we do? We basically lower ourselves or, or put ourselves back into that place of honoring the nation that had actually overthrown our queen and, and has caused all this pilikia mm -hmm. for over a century. So um, there's things like that that we need to start to become much more uh, proactive about mm -hmm. and, and making sure that in our own lives that we're not doing that same thing, reverting into a practice that we had become a taught, that we had been taught to, to mouth and, and making sure that we don't do that anymore. And, and to, to replace that with thinking of ourselves as being free as a, as a nation and free as Kanaka. Um, and that start, we start to identify ourselves uh, in our daily activities and our practices and things like that with being representative of who we are. You know, Leon, I'd like to bounce off of what you just said. Okay. And I'd like to take it one step further. Sometimes, and I come from this sometime, I turned 50 this year. And in my earlier years of advocacy in and around our community for the, all the different things that I put my face and my voice out there for, I came across in ways that were often very condescending and demeaning and degrading mm. of my own fellow Kanaka. And not only that, but Kanaka that were older than me. And they were also Kanaka that were, you know, they, they had political responsibility. Now, I want everybody to think about this. Here's where when we politically disagree, we must find it within ourselves to not completely destroy mm. the heart and spirit of the person on the other end of our conversation or engage just because we have a political difference. Ew. Because if we do that, where then is the value of what we are advocating for if we only achieve this by decimating or, or, or reducing someone's value or worth in them mm -hmm. to nothing? And so, here's a good example. My mother. My mother is now 75. My mother comes from the generation that was very much colonized knows no other reality except that of an affinity to the United States of America. Now, mind you, she eventually made the jump mm. over to being a pro-independence advocate and staunch supporter. But it took my mother a long time in her life's journey. For Auntie Luana, uh, the Merry Monarch, 
I advocate mm -hmm. for people that um, let us be diplomatic, let us be kind. If it was Auntie Luana or anybody else as part of the, the, um, the committee that oversees the Merry Monarch, when we want to challenge something, we don't necessarily have to try to take somebody out right. with a machete. Right. But we simply must allow each individual that we work with or engage with the time to say, ah, I see what you're saying without trying to force them into a reality that they weren't prepared to deal with. Mm -hmm. You know, and teaching, now I don't know about you, but at, at someone um, at age 50, if I had to relearn something, unless I was really determined to relearn something, it's gonna be a hard thing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the process of decolonization can sometimes be very challenging, sometimes can be painful because these elements have been a part of our lives for a very long time. So I advocate for all of you to find the aloha in your heart. And it's not what we say, but it's how we aye, say it. Aye. Mahalo, that's, that's very profound. And this is, you know, my, the work that I do uh -huh. uh, at the UN I'm a diplomat, and the idea of diplomacy is that you're trying to make friends. You try, and so when when there are disagreements or a difference of opinion, you're trying to actually make sure that you're not alienating that yes. person while right. while you're trying to argue your point or and all that. And then and it's okay if you don't settle it then and there. Yes. You know, you give it time. You give people the space to hear you and, and, and they consider, and you do the same thing. You have to listen to yes. the other person. Yes. And so it's dip diplomacy is the Western word for it, but you know, what, what we're looking at is really aloha. It we're, is. We're, yeah, aloha. we're saying aloha. We treat each other with aloha, and we do that in a way that we settle our disputes or at least come to a, a pono with our disputes rather than uh, winning all the time. Yes. You know, and so that's a very Western thing. Mm -hmm. Gotta win, yes. right? In fact, even when they talk about uh, settling something between two people, they call it a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. Now, a win-win situation still is in terms of one person being the victor and the other person being the one defeated, or or both now are the victors. It still has that that um, uh, context of being victorious or defeated, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So I was talking with the mm -hmm. ambassador from Kiribati not too long ago, um, and, um, and he said, you know, we stopped talking about win-win, we're talking about happy-happy. In mm -hmm. other words, that's our goal. We want to make both sides happy. And I said, that is so island, that, that is so us, you know. That's what we need to be doing. We, we need to start changing our own mindset so that we're, looking, we're seeking happy, happy, both sides happy, both sides pleased with the outcome. Aye. Yeah. Mahalo, Leon. You know, when we talk about Hawaii becoming free, that an independent Hawaii, and people uh, you know, talk to us about that, um, quite often they ask some questions that are kind of surprising, but maybe not so much. In other words, uh, some people are kind of in a knee-jerk reaction, ask like, the first thing that comes on, onto their minds, and they'll ask questions like, if Hawaii becomes free, do all the other people have to leave the islands? And, and I, we go, slow down. <laughs> you know, they're making mm -hmm. some assumptions that, that they think Hawaiians are going to act like Haole. They're going to get everybody to leave because now we own this place. Uh, you know, so, but that's not who we are. And I think that um, a lot of inadvertent questions get asked like that. But mm -hmm. again, like you were expressing before, we need to actually malama these people uh, to get them to understand and to be able to come to think about this in, in a more uh, r rational manner uh, to, to understand that, no, we're not going to be kicking everybody out because that's not who we are. You know, we just talked about this nation, the Lahui, being inclusive, 
uh, but, but we still have some standards, of course, that we're going to maintain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Those who want to leave, yes, you may. But it's not automatic that everybody has to leave if they're not Kanaka. Oh, yeah. And I believe that both you and I have been asked this kind of question before, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's not uncommon then for somebody to walk up to you and say, Leon, so if someone is not Kanaka Maoli, do we have to leave Hawaii? Mm -hmm. um, what other questions or, or what other things have you encountered? Uh, well, another question that, um, uh, do you have to be part of the nation to live in Hawaii? That is, do you have to declare yourself a Hawaiian national <laughs> to be able to live in Hawaii? And again, this is, of course, a question asked uh, genuinely from mo people who are concerned about this, but this also reveals the type of uh, how they think in terms of they're going to be excluded because they're not Kanaka or they're not part of the Lahui. Um, and so to that again, the, the answer is if you stop and think about it, no, we're not going to behave that way. We're not going to chase people out of our country because you, you, uh, you can't, or we're not going to say you can't live here because you're, you're not uh, Hawaiian national or Kanaka. So, um, Again, this is just food for thought. If, if, if you would stop and think of the questions that immediately come to your mind, and then stop and think, now is this, uh, am I just knee-jerking uh, a question, or, or is, is this something real that I'm concerned about? And, and I would say, you know, initially it's, it's a real concern, and it's, it's, it's a, uh, a knee-jerk reaction. But just to, the, just to think about it for a moment, then uh, you actually start to think, well, maybe that's not the right question to ask. The question is, how am I going to be part of this nation? And what do you think about this, Hina? I have given some great thought to this, and so I didn't just arrive at this yesterday. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I have noticed over the years that many of our people don't fully grasp the depth and the complexity sometimes of how governments operate. That there is a difference between the US federal government, the current de facto state government, and underneath that, the respective city and county of, whether it be Honolulu or any other island. Mm -hmm. If we're talking about the current political status, and this translates into when our people are faced with discussions and, and moments of engage on political independence, people don't always realize that <clears throat> some of the basic issues, some of the basic problems, they don't ever change. They don't go away. Mm -hmm. The government that is going to preside or adjudicate or lead or guide or govern, that's what's going to make the difference. And so um, no matter what political system we're under, I advocate for our people to really know what are the intimacies under the current American bipartisan politics. Do our people really know about differences in, uh, in parties when it comes to American politics? When it comes to uh, Hawaiian independence, do our people really understand what it means to be a citizen? Because this, um, this will bring up this question that we have prepared for this evening, and that is that, are you still a part of the nation if you don't live here? Now that is something to think about. If one remains a citizen of the independent kingdom or the independent government mm -hmm. of Hawaii, for example, then one is required to observe certain Polities. Uh, one is required to observe certain, you know, guidelines or, or expectations or sometimes restrictions. Mm -hmm. um, for example, at one time I had prepared to gain Tongan citizenship, but it was not that I was going to renounce a U.S. passport, but I was going to seek dual citizenship. 
in the case of Hawaii being an independent government, the question of do you have to give up your U.S. citizenship? Do, do we have to give up being a U.S. citizen or holding a, a U.S. passport to become a Hawaiian national? Therein lies some of the, the little intimate details of what, you know, how, how do we handle this? How do we look at it? Um, what do you, what do you, uh, what is your take on this, Leon? Well, um, as you know, like I said, I, I deal in international affairs and, um, and passports and that those types of instruments are really vital <coughs> to people being able to identify who they are and being able to be protected when they travel and things like that. So, but the case of like, let's say Hawaii, um, uh, the time when Hawaii becomes an independent nation and you are able to make your decision as far as who you're joined, making your allegiance to and, and becoming a Hawaiian national or as you're saying, Hawaiian citizen um, and what do you do with the America's citizenship? Now, of course, we have been working on this for quite a while or have had experience in this. A while ago, um, we're talking 30 years ago nearly, a uh, number of us you know, considered this and we said, if we maintain our U.S. citizenship, then would we have a conflict of allegiance? In other words, are we going to become conflicted over being pulled toward the U.S. or being pulled toward our own nation. So we made a decision then that for those of us, we would be strictly Hawaiian nationals that, so that we would not be conflicted with allegiance to another country. Now, of course, this leads to a number of problems of living within the United States system and so we've had to kind of live in the outskirts or in the fringes of the system, try not to upset it and try not to keep, get our heads too high above uh, so that we get chopped off, you know. And, and a lot of our people have actually been persecuted for saying that they're Hawaiian nationals and that they, they are not, uh, they're not Americans. And persecuted by meaning that they, they meant it by saying, well, I don't, owe income taxes to the United States and things mm -hmm. like that. So when you start confronting uh, the U.S. in that way, then it can become very costly to you. And the, the U.S. does not take, or and the state of Hawaii do not take kindly to that. And we have friends that have spent time in jail mm -hmm. and been fined and really ruined, their lives ruined in many, many cases by making a stand. But anyway, again, back to the idea of, of Hawaiian being a Hawaiian national. I think that it is critical, it's particularly in the early stages, that people are, have to make a decision mm -hmm. as to who they are. Because otherwise, the conflict <coughs> with being a U.S. citizen and an dual citizenship, the conflict can be very, very disruptive to the functioning of our nation, yes. especially yes. early on. Yeah. So um, during the time of the Hawaiian Kingdom, there was no such thing as dual citizenship. Yes. It was one or the other. Speaking in theory, if I were to hold a Hawaiian national passport and I retained dual citizenship with the United States of America, retaining that dual citizenship would allow me free travel if I were going to America. If I were going mm -hmm. to the continental U.S., if I were to choose to be exclusively, um, you know, in alignment with being a Hawaiian national citizen, that means that the United States of America might require me to apply for a visa, mm -hmm. and applying for a visa, if anyone knows now, and, and vice versa, and, and vice versa, <clears throat> it mm -hmm. would require a U.S. citizen to apply for a visa to come to Hawaii if Hawaii implemented such laws. Mm -hmm. um, during the COVID pandemic, we saw at one time where visitors to Hawaii, many of our people said, close the gates, shut down the airport, don't let people come in. Because the thought was to not let anybody else outside enter into Hawaii. However, being 
considered the 50th state of the Union of the United States of America, we don't have the last say on our ports mm -hmm. and our harbors. Mm -hmm. We're not able to control who is able to enter into Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So these kinds of situations, now this is certainly not the only kind of situation. These kinds of situations require critical thinking. Another example, the reason why I mentioned a moment ago that I was seeking Tongan citizenship was because I was currently at that time married to a Tongan and also that there was talk of engaging in business. Now, in order for you to engage in business, you have to have a Tongan citizen partner to engage in international business. But to aid that, I was also going to apply for Tongan citizenship. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it didn't mean that I would renounce the current citizenship, but it meant that by being a citizen also of that country, that it would afford me certain rights and privileges to do things in that country. Mm -hmm. that's, um, uh, that's some of the nuances of understanding what does it mean to be a citizen of a government? What does it mean to have rights, privileges? Um, when U.S. nationals go overseas and they're part of perhaps a U U.S. international, or excuse me, an international incident, and we've seen many people who end up in prison in another country, and there have been times where the United States had to intervene. Mm -hmm. Yes? Right. That's the duty, that's the responsibility of a government yes. to speak up on behalf of its citizen and to go to bat for its citizen. Right. So I encourage our people to really try to delve into the understanding of how, how does a government work? How does a democratic government work? How does other mm -hmm. forms of government also work? In traditional Hawaii, if we really thought about how traditional uh, governance of land, natural mm -hmm. resources, and people, how that took place, we would find a very different Hawaii. Yes. Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to, um, let's say, freedom. Mm -hmm. It really looks different if we were applying traditional Hawaiian ways of governance, much like a halau. Mm -hmm. A halau is not a democratic oriented mm -hmm. organization. Yes. <laughs> the, ruling, uh, the ruling class is the kumu the kumuhula, mm -hmm. and if the haumana didn't agree with it, well, sorry, you're out. <laughs> you're out. <laughs> I, so yes, there are different forms of governance. So <coughs> the, the understand, understanding, um, let's see uh, how the U.S. government functions, actually gives us a very good um, idea of, of what we need to mm. work toward. In, yes. in, in other words, we have to clean it up mm -hmm for our government to, mm -hmm. to function. Mm -hmm. you know, and again, the form of government that the Hawaiian Kingdom was, was a participatory constitutional monarchy. So we had votes and we had a say in our representatives and, and uh, even ultimately the mo'i, when, when if one, uh, the seat was vacant and you had to choose a new mo'i, there was a process for it. So, um, so this is one of, one of the challenges that we have, and that is uh, understanding and actually being ma to how we're going to govern ourselves and, and what we have to relearn and what we have to actually innovate on uh, with what we already know. So uh, this is going to be one of the areas we really have to work on. So Leon, we've had a really provocative discussion here this evening and we've had some wonderful sharing but let's continue on a little bit more before we wrap up wrap up this evening and i'm curious what are your thoughts on who gets to move to hawaii okay so that is of course a big big question and and a, a very pertinent one because uh, hawaii has experienced um not, our Hawaiians have experienced the, the situation of not being able to, uh, to decide who gets to move here. And in fact, people have moved here completely without the Hawaiians' permission or, or input or without asking Hawaiians about that. And that's because of 
course, the United States um, policies, and they controlled the in-migration, much to the detriment of Hawaiians, because now, of course, we're a very, very, uh, well, we're, we're not a small minority, mm -hmm. but we're a minority within our own islands. Um, and that, that's talking about ethnicity, of course, but the same thing with, uh, it has to do with nationality. Mm -hmm. That is, the majority of the people who live in Hawaii, the vast majority consider themselves U.S. citizens. And, and so they're living here now. So who gets to decide who comes when the Hawaiian Islands is an independent nation? It's actually the government of the Hawaiian Islands and the people of the Hawaiian Islands. In other words, we would have to weigh the uh, situation and actually decide whether or not we're going to allow uh, huge migration or if we're going to control it in some way. And I would expect we would have to control it because mm -hmm. we're really at this point to the max of what our islands can actually support and sustain. I really, really like this particular discussion topic because it is key to understanding even more some of the intimacies about how a government works. Let's take, for example, let's use America as an example. During the former President Barack Obama's time, immigration looked a certain way. And there was a far more open door policy when it came to people coming into the US. Under former President uh, Trump, under his uh, administration, <clears throat> there were moves made to not be as open and to not be a shelter for people um, crossing the border, especially in uh, what would be considered an illegal crossing. People look at the views of Democratic and Republican views. The main understanding is that it is the government that determines what is the policy. So it's absolutely essential. Mm -hmm. If in any kind of democratic process where people vote and you get to have a say, it's important to think who are you empowering to say? Who are you empowering to be the voice? Ha, um, and that is from, if there, if there is such a thing as an executive branch and any other um, you know, type of public elected officials in the current state of Hawaii context, um, you have the House of Representatives and you have the Senate and above them is the governor. Now, in that scenario, each individual elected representative is responsible for enacting what is supposed to be the will of the people. How does this translate to us in the discussion of political independence for Hawaii? Mm -hmm. So we ask ourselves, what's going to happen to our land? Who gets to move here? What's what is the vision of our nation mm -hmm. and how will it differ from the current state of Hawaii were our independence to be reinstated, were mm -hmm. it to be implemented back and now calling the shots? What do you think? Right. Okay. So the key <coughs> is who makes the decision. Who makes the decision? As, as a sovereign nation, then the Hawaiian, Hawaiian nation ma makes that decision. So we control borders, we control our, our borders, we control um, what's going on with housing and things like that. Now the land issues is, is, is a huge thing, of course, because we have had this tremendous in-migration that have basically taken over our lands, mm -hmm. you know, so that Hawaiians have been forced off our lands. And, but our nation can actually put it back proper into proper standing because we have records of who actually owns those lands. Mm -hmm. And so we can, it's gonna be a big, big struggle and it's gonna take time, but we do have the process to, to actually make things pono again. We can put this back again, back together into a proper uh, standing. Um, and the way we do it is through the laws of our nation and through the uh, administration that enforces the laws of that nation of our nation. So the decisions are really, like you were saying, the laws are created by the legislators. 
you know, so mm -hmm. it's going to be, as a Hawaiian nation, it, the legislators that are chosen to make the laws, particularly laws about immigration and land and things like that, that's made by our, rep our elected representatives. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the, once those laws are made, then it's up to the king, whoever the executive is, to enforce or to carry out those laws. So there is a process there that we have to, uh, that will come into play, and we'll have to trust in it. But the main point is that we would be making the de decisions. This is called self-determination, exactly. not for somebody in Washington, D.C., and not mm -hmm. for the interests of the United States, but for our own mm. interests. We make the decisions for what will benefit us best, and it will be a homegrown uh, yes. decision making. Yes, exactly, Leon. And that's why it's imperative for our viewers to really give some consideration to that which we've spoken about mm -hmm. at the table tonight. Imagine an independent Hawaiian government, but imagine our people not being able to shift outside of the parameters of American bipartisan politics. Mm -hmm. This is something that comes to my mind on too many occasions. For as many years as I have been a staunch supporter of an independent Hawaii, reinstatement of our government, and restoring authority to our people. Mm -hmm. My biggest concern was, do our people really understand that once we don't have to live under the current rules, policies, regulations, expectations, it's not necessarily intended for us to become a free-for-all and you know everything right. free that you want to, however you want to do it. But do our people really understand? Mm -hmm. And and will we step up? Yes, and will to we take step the kuleana? Up? Yes. Yeah. As we bring our uh, viewers out there in wherever they may be in the pai aina, as we wrap our thoughts up we should be thinking of these very important things. What's going to be the vision mm -hmm. of our nation and for our nation? Mm -hmm. And how will it be different from that of the current vision of the state of Hawaii? How will it be different from this understanding? How will it be different from that paradigm of our existence? Yes. And you know this whole discussion has been really just to stimulate thinking uh, among our viewers. And many of you have already been thinking about these things, practical things that we can do on an everyday basis. One, we want to take the word mainland out of our vocabulary. And you can do this anytime. Anytime you, see your, you feel yourself starting to say mainland, please don't. And the other thing is that start to think of yourself as living in the Hawaiian Kingdom right now. The Hawaiian Kingdom actually never disappeared. It's still here. It's just been overlaid by some other outside influences. But the Hawaiian Kingdom is still here. So when, when you wake up in the morning, where did you wake up? You woke up in the Hawaiian Kingdom. When you had your breakfast, you had breakfast in the Hawaiian Kingdom. When you went about doing the errands of the day, you did that in the Hawaiian Kingdom. All of this reflects and helps to change your mind into thinking that you actually are, and not just thinking, but convincing yourself and reinforcing that you are in the Hawaiian Kingdom. The question I pose to all of you, where is your Pico? I know where my Pico is. What is and who is and where is my motherland? And so as we think of moving ahead to the future, I ask, all of you are fellow Kanaka, and any and all of you whom support us. With the, the focus being on our Hawaiian community, where is our Pico? And if you are proud to say that you're Hawaiian, could you do it without feeling some kind of way and without needing to honor somebody else? Would you be able to do it and simply uplift our people as our Lahui, both the insular Lahui Kanaka and the larger 
lahui o kapai aina. Ai. Mahalo for joining us for this edition of Free Hawaii News. We've been really happy to have you here, and we hope that this has stimulated some conversations and some thinking uh, for a free Hawaii and for the future of Hawaii Ne. Ai, mahalo anui. No leila e kia nai na o ko e kipa mai nei. Pe nei no ko kaku mau mana ono ke yahi yahi a o ko mau wahi i ini ho ikea na o ko no e no no mai nune nune mai a e nana ku no i mua a e no no pe he alana ko kaku pono no ke ya mua ku. No leila mahalo anui ko kaku hui ana a hui ho aloha. We hope you enjoyed this month's episode of Free Hawaii News. Mahalo for watching. There's a new show every month, so this program will air several more times this month. You can view it anytime on Olelo's on-demand site or on YouTube. See you next time. Ahui ho! Aloha aina!